Hi guys, it's Luke here and I'm back to give you a video introduction to using E2 as a REST API. If you don't know about REST APIs, then you probably need to do some reading because uh, I don't really have time to explain lots and lots of stuff. But the basic idea with an API in general is that it, this isn't a service that returns web pages or HTML or anything like that. It generally takes a request, which would either be XML or JSON. So the request could just be a couple of simple pieces of data. And then the API will do something with that data. It might create a new object. It might return some information or whatever. So you're kind of dealing with the low level of web applications, really. So you've got the same basic architecture. You've got controllers, models, but you don't have views. Instead, you're returning raw data and then you let the system format that data depending on what the client wants back, whether that's JSON or XML. And to do this in Yi is really quite straightforward. They've got lots of stuff built in, which is great. And so what I've done here is I've started with the basic application template in my API. Unfortunately, at the moment, there isn't a an API template to start with, but I want to try and fix that soon. Once I've got this system working properly, I'm going to create that template on my own GitHub account. Maybe the eSoft guys will pull it into their repo, whatever, it does, doesn't really matter. But all I've done on top of that in terms of the vendor side of things is I've added a single package here, which is MongoDB. And the reason I've done this is because Mongo or other NoSQL databases are very commonly used nowadays for APIs. NoSQL databases tend to scale pretty well. They're fairly easy to use. They tend to be quite fast. And you tend to not have to do very much work on the database. You do more work in the application. And the database kind of ends up being a bit more like a bucket where you just throw all your documents and, and get them back when you need them. So MongoDB is a pretty cool choice. There are others, but MongoDB is fairly well supported on Yi. And what I've actually got here is I'm using VirtualBox and I have MongoDB running on an Ubuntu server on VirtualBox. And that's just because I run all my test databases on there. They tend to be a little bit quicker and easier to install on Linux than they do on Windows. But there is MongoDB for Windows if you like. And the other thing that's quite useful when you're debugging is I've got this, which is Compass. And Compass is a Windows tool that basically allows you to visualize what's in your MongoDB database. So in this case, there's already a document in there, which you'll come back and look at soon. So nothing else special in Composer. Now, what I want to do, I'm probably going to have to come back to the configuration a couple of times because there are a few things that we need to set in here related to different parts of what we're actually doing. But a couple of the initial things to note is that in our request by default, I believe that we don't have a JSON parser. Now, in a case of a normal web application, you would never get a JSON request. You would get a normal HTTP request and it would just work as you would expect. In our case, because we've got an API, we're going to expect some kind of text request. And very often it's JSON just because JSON's fairly easy to read and debug. It's text safe. It's just going to kind of work. So we need to make sure that we've added a parser to the request object. Another thing to note here is we need to both disable the cross-site request forgery cookie. And we also need to set enable session to false under the user. And the reason is these two things will generate cookies and we're not going to be using cookies at all for an API. We're going to do uh, authentication in a different way. In an API, you tend to try and avoid having any uh, any state information because then things go a bit awry when you try and fire lots of requests at stuff. Trying to keep that state up to date is very fragile. So we try and design our system so that we don't need any state. We let the front end worry about what it wants to do and we just give the data back. So there are two important things we need to set. If you don't set those, then you might end up with an error about the cross-site request forgery um, cookie token, wherever it is. I think it's in one of the config files not being set. Uh, but also you'll just get a cookie sent back to the client, which is 
a waste of time and a waste of bandwidth. So we need to do those couple of things. The other thing is we're going to need, in my example, we're going to use a user object. And that's because we need to demonstrate or I want to demonstrate how we actually restrict access to the controllers. Now, in the basic template, when you first create this user, you get an in-memory user. So it has a, an array in there with two hard-coded users with fixed passwords. And that's just to make it all kind of easy and it means you don't need to use a database on the basic one however because we are going to be using a database you don't have to for demo purposes but obviously in real life you're going to be having to access the database for that so effectively the user that we have is based on the one that you find in the advanced template so if you go to github.com slash yeesoft slash ye2 app advanced and you dig down into common models user you'll find a user that's based on active records and this is 90 percent of of what we have we basically copied and pasted it and changed a couple of things that we'll look at in a minute so there are two kind of things that we can do really in terms of controllers so like i said we're still using kind of model controller architecture we don't have views in the same sense because we're not actually sending back a web page we're sending back just some data but we still have controllers we still have models and the two ways you can produce a controller and we'll show both of them one of them if we use ye rest active controller then that can make our life quite easy for simple cases where we have an item like token and then the we want to kind of create a token, delete a token, update a token, all, all that kind of stuff. Then this active controller here will scaffold a lot of that for us. And you can say there's not really a lot of other code in here to do that. So that's one way of creating a controller. And the second way is where we don't want any of the auto magical stuff. We want to kind of really wire it all ourselves. So I've got an example of that called API controller. These names are just names that I've chosen. They're, they're not special names. Token controller because I have a model called token and the, an API controller that doesn't actually have any model associated with it. I just use it to demonstrate how you can have a, a more customized controller. And then in my case, I've got two models, the user, which we've already talked about, but there are more properties and, and methods in there that we'll look at in a bit and token, which is just an example model that I've created to demonstrate the API. So the first thing I want to talk about is structure of a REST controller. Now, if you go to the documentation about RESTful web services in the YouTube guide, you'll see that one of the sections, which is actually later on, but you kind of should really learn about it at the beginning, is their recommended tip about versioning. Now, something that you don't necessarily think about until you need to make a change to your API and then you suddenly think, oh, hang on a second, people are going to be using the old API. If I change it, I'm going to break something because the client's assuming certain data is going to come back or certain data needs to be posted. So a good versioning scheme allows you to update the functionality of the API while still allowing the old versions to continue running as they were before. And the easiest way to do this is a combination of separate controllers. So each time you add a new version of an API, you can simply add a new controller class. But also to kind of help with some of the shared code, you can also inherit from a common base class, which I haven't actually done, but it's it's kind of here. So I've got an API controller here that doesn't actually do anything. So I could use this as a base class for this API controller. So if I then added another API controller, I could also inherit from this and I could put common code down in here. So the way they recommend to do versioning, which is pretty straightforward, is to use the E2 modules functionality. And all a module really is, is a set of code, but often containing controllers, models, views, if it was a web app, but it isn't and then a single module class. So this module is pretty much a normal class. It inherits the base module from the Yi project in vendor. And the only thing I actually set here is a controller namespace. So when this module gets loaded, 
if this needs to find a controller the system knows where to go and look for that and these just follow normal namespace conventions so there's nothing weird there but i've called this module v1 if i added another version i could call it v2 v3 etc and i you know in some ways only need to override the the things that i've changed so actually if i added a v2 and didn't change token controller I could add a token controller in V2, simply inherit that one and not override anything. So I could do it that way uh, or, you know, add, add a separate path for that and that, whatever I want to do. But the, the basic idea is we've got a module for each version and then we wire them up. So let's go back and look at the URL manager quickly. So you can see here that we've got two rules. So this one is for the API controller and in normal kind of ye fashion, I don't need to put the word controller in there. This basically says module V1 API controller is going to handle some rest URL uh, rules, which we'll look at what they look like in a minute. And exactly the same thing for the token controller. So as you can see, I've got both of them here. Ignore that one because like I say, it's not really wired up, but it could be. So I could just delete that. And the other thing just worth mentioning quickly is you can restrict what each controller can do. So I can say, well, the API controller doesn't actually allow delete, create and update, which would otherwise be automatically wide up for it. So I can do that as well if I like. But in terms of the rules, what this URL rule does, which is the kind of the magic bit, is that effectively expresses a number of different routes. So if we look here. All of these routes get populated automatically by the URL rule rule. So all I have to do is add one line and it will create me for, let's say, the token controller, put and patch token, delete token, get head token, post token, etc., etc. So it just saves me adding a rule for each of these for every single controller. So that's what that is. Nice, quick way of doing that. Strict parsing is kind of up to you whether you want that turned on. If you don't turn it on, it will try a default rule. If it can't find anything else, it's up to you whether you like that or not. And in terms of the show script name and the pretty URL, if you want to have pretty URLs, which look like, say, that rather than uh, this, which would be the uh, default that would be the default way of drawing the URL. If you want the pretty URLs like that, then you're going to have to set up a rewrite rule on your web server. So I'm running this under IIS. I've got a rewrite rule that basically says anything it can't find that, that, that looks like a file, but it's not a file or a directory. So it's going to redirect that automatically to index.php. So that's, that's not any different here than it is in a web application. In my case, I've got it that kind of enabled but you don't have to it will, it will still work so that's the kind of the module setup but the, like I say the only reason for using modules is for versioning otherwise if you were just doing something really simple you could chuck everything in controllers and in this case rather than having v1 slash token if you just had token it would look in a normal controllers directory Obviously, if you add modules, if you've ever done them before, you know that you also need a module section, which again tells ye where to find stuff. So this is saying that the module called V1, which is that one there, the base path is app modules V1, which might work by default anyway. And then the actual module class itself, which is in the same place, app modules V1 module is just that. And again, doesn't really do very much in the module. So that's that. Now, if we want to go and look at, uh, let's look at the magic controller, because that's kind, kind of the easiest one. So first of all, let's have a very quick look at our token. So this token, like I say, it's a, just an example model. It doesn't mean anything. It's just something I've decided to call it. So things worth noticing here. First of all, it extends the MongoDB active record. All of this will work with normal active record and a SQL database. The only difference is if you use the MongoDB one, you have to set these two functions. If you don't set these, it's not going to work. So it doesn't work the same way as a SQL database, although it's kind of similar. In this case, a collection is a little bit like a table name. So instead of in a, a normal DB active record, you actually have a, a table name function that returns a thing. You know, it normally looks like this, doesn't it? 
and that's just to do the, the the table expansion so we have a very similar thing but it's called collection name that's just to know in here let's go back to uh, that one there so that just means that is the collection it's called token that's where i expect to find my documents so nothing strange there and then attributes is just a way of saying well in these documents you don't have to have every attribute set so what we're saying here is this is every attribute that our model can have so even if they're not in here you still need to create magic getters and setters for these in our model so that's all that is again i've just chosen these at random in mongodb you have to have an underscore id because that's the default identity value other than that you just have whatever you like but in the same way as normal active record if we have created that and updated that and had a timestamp behavior then this will automatically set those to the current time when the model gets created so that's quite handy but that's not anything different and two other things that are kind of significant for apis in the same way as normal models if you don't have some the field names the attributes specified in the rules then when you want to create a new token and you post the data the data won't get assigned to the attributes and it won't get saved and that's because by default it will assume attributes are not safe and it's only if you have a rule for it and if there's no other rule you can have a rule called safe uh, that is actually one of the validators but in this case everything that we want to set has an entry in here those three are strings those two are integers so don't forget your rules otherwise your post won't do what you want it to do and the other one that's kind of important this is to do with the api it's not to do with mongo is that we can specify which fields get returned to the user when they request stuff through the controller and if we kind of demonstrate that if i go and have a look in here you can see in the object i created an attribute called secret and it has some secret information the only reason i've called it secret is so it's obvious what it is and you can see i've defined it here to tell the mongo active record that there is an attribute called secret even if you can't see it in the document there is a secret i've added it as a rule so i can set it when i create a new token and i've missed it out from this list so that if i go back here i'll we'll talk about this in a second but if i go here and i request the tokens there is only one it's basically that one if you can see here the secret isn't returned and it isn't returned because i missed it out of the list so all of this is documented on here you'll find in uh which one will this be resources you have the stuff here it talks about fields overriding the fields um in there extra fields allows you to say you're not normally going to get profile back but if you request it in the url you can return profile as well so uh, that can be pretty cool but let's not go too crazy to begin with so that's kind of all we really need to know about token there's nothing particularly special about it just a random model so let's look at the token controller now for the start i'm going to comment that out and i'm going to comment that out which isn't used anyway and i'm going to save that just to show you that all you need to create a rest controller is to extend ye rest active controller now notice that's not the same as ye rest controller so this is an active controller which means it's based on a model and you need to set the model class property so this is all you need to do to make a token controller so um, in order to get the name of that i just call token colon colon class that will basically set the right name for that and just to prove that that works i jump back into here and if i run this there you go just works as you might imagine so that's dead easy to do and uh, th and that's it if you notice here i can do loads of stuff so let's add a new token i can do um let's just change that to something else some other secret and if i send this did i send it that might happen very quickly I don't know if i press send or not oh there we go definitely send it that time so now we've got two so that all i've done there all that is it's the same endpoint and it's a post same endpoint as that but by calling get that says get back all of the tokens if i send that again 
I've obviously got two now. And that one there, same endpoint with a post. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a big list in routing. You can see all of the different things that you can do and it tells you here what they do. So if you call get on users or this is obviously for a user's controller, list all users, show the overview of the information, create a new one, return the details, blah, 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 blah. So that's all pretty cool. Again, you might want to use lots of that. You might not. And as you mentioned earlier in the rule, if you say, actually, I don't really want those ones, you can just exclude them in the rule and say, I don't want people to be able to delete it. So that is how you do a magic controller. We'll talk about this bit in a second. If we want to do most of it ourselves, so we could have in this case just a basic controller. This has got nothing wired up by default. So if I call kind of APIs on this, which is that one, send, all it does is returns that. So I've had to add an action index. I think if I comment that out and I run that, I'll get nothing. Yeah, I get 404. So in this case, I'm not getting the methods for for free. And that's because I've used the, the more base controller and I didn't use the active controller. So obviously in here, I've got much more control as to what I want to do. But it takes a little bit extra kind of kind of brains to work out what action is going to be called when I call uh, certain things here. So I can kind of work out that these things are going to call the index action and I could do stuff with that. And I don't actually know what, you know, what the others would all call, but it'd be fairly easy to work it out, find out how it resolves in the URL controller. But here I can kind of do whatever I want. All I'm doing is returning a string, nothing particularly clever. So in terms of actually creating the raw controller, dead easy, not really anything to do. In fact, less work normally than a normal controller. So let's look at some of, some of the more clever stuff. And one, the first thing I want to look at is this idea of authentication. And this is, you know, another thing where you can't think about it after you've written the API because it kind of changes so many things. There's extra code you need to do. You want to be starting with all of the building blocks in place. And that's why I want to turn this into a Yee template that you guys can use. I want you to be able to kind of start by saying I have a behavior and I'm going to use HTTP bearer auth. Now, when you're calling an API endpoint, you don't have a web page to log in and do all the rest of it in a normal sense because you're just calling something directly using a, a, a data kind of an HTTP client and you're getting back data. There's there's no kind of user interaction there. So instead, you tend to pass some kind of token. You can use OAuth2, you can use OpenID Connect, you can do you know a number of things just to get that token, which at the end of the day is just a big, long, random number. But that random number, the fact that you know that proves that you have permission to access this. Now, I haven't built the mechanism to actually, you know, define all of that and how that works. What I have done is I've created my users. If I go back here and look at my user, I've got my information here and I've got a field called auth key that the normal user you get out of the advanced template creates one of those automatically when you create a new user. So what I actually did was I used a website to the Yee2 website to create that user, save it all into my compass thing here. And then I use that auth key as my authentication. And what bearer auth looks like, there's a couple of options here, but really this is kind of the one you should really be using. If you look here, all we do is we pass a header. The header's called authorization. And in this case, bearer auth has the word bearer, then a space, and then that token. So let's just add another just random number on the end of it so that the token's incorrect. If we send that, you notice that the system will automatically send a 401 unauthorized response. So what's actually happened there is it's tried to look up a user by that token. It hasn't found a user. So by definition, you don't have permission to access it. Now, if I turn that back to the correct number and send it again, then it works. Now notice it 
it's found a user. I haven't actually done anything with that user. I haven't asked any questions. I haven't done any authorization. But by adding the HTTP bearer auth, there's an assumption that a token has to match a user and that user then has to has to exist. And in this case, it does exist. It lets me in. And that's the, the basics of bearer auth. You can use HTTP basic authentication, to be honest. I don't really see the point because bearer auth is not exactly difficult, as you can see. And, you know, same with digest. You can use digest. It's better than basic, but it's still pretty kind of pointless so bear auth you can do that you pass a token uh, and notice here that all i've had to do is get the parent behaviors add another one to it called authenticator of this type and then return the, the complete list so again nothing difficult hardly any code and i've got a controller that's protected but that's kind of only half the story so let's go back to here and, and wire this one back in so this is the same. What I've actually done here, though, is I've added a cause filter. And the problem with the cause filter is the cause filter has to happen before authentication takes place because cause is allowed to happen without authentication. So I have to do something slightly more complicated here. I unset any authenticator that might be present in the parent behaviors. There shouldn't be one, but if there is, it unsets it. Then it adds a cause filter. If you don't know what cause is, go and read up about it because that's a whole video in its, its own right. Adds the cause one, then adds the bearer auth authenticator afterwards. And the reason we do that is we then say in your authentication, don't do authentication if it's an options request. And what does that look like? Well, let's go back to the, the one that calls the token controller. And notice here again, I've got the authorization thing in here. So let me just, if I just change that, so it's an invalid header and I send it, notice you get a 401 as you would expect. There's no authorization header because I've spelled it wrong. So it can't find a user, the, the 401 comes back. If, however, I send an options request, which is what Ajax does, well, what we call pre-flight. So that's kind of saying, if I call you from my URL, are you going to be, are you going to play nice with me or not? And that options pre-flight happens. Notice here that doesn't come back with a body, but it does come back saying that if you call this, you're allowed to call it with get, post, head and options, which is correct. So I can try all of those. And then it says things like, uh, I don't know if it's probably not added it because I've not set it. But it could say there should be there's normally an allowed origins header. So if I want to restrict it to certain origins, like you can only call this from Google.com or whatever, then that would be a header as well. But, but I'm not using that. So you can call options without needing the authentication, but you can't call get without authentication. You'll get 401. If I send the authentication, I get the results back. So that's what the, the cause bit is. I've included this method, but I'm not actually using it. But effectively what happens is you've got to understand that authentication is really just finding a user and proving that you're the user. So that's what happens with the token. We pass in a token. The token links to a user in there because it matches that auth key. So it loads this user. But then after we've done that, almost always we need to have some kind of mechanism to say, but is this user allowed to do what they're specifically asking to do? And you notice here that we get given the action. So we can say, well, you know, if in this case, this example, if you want to update it or delete it, you can only do that if the author ID matches the current user ID. So remember, this is always going to be populated because we require authentication. If they don't match, you're going to get a forbidden exception, a 403 going to be sent back. If it does match, it will let you do it. And of course, you could put any kinds of logic in here. You could check the current user. You could say, is the current user an admin? Do they have XYZ role? Does their email address have a certain domain in it? You could do whatever you like. But the point is, this part is authorization. And in general, you need to do both. You need to find the user by the token. You then need to check access. And obviously you can apply the cause and the check access 
to the other controller as well. They're not unique to active controllers, but otherwise, hopefully you can see that's all pretty straightforward. So that's most of that. The last thing I want to look at is the user. And the main reason for that is rate limiting. So another issue about APIs, and actually it applies to web applications as well, but it happens more readily on APIs, is people sending too many requests to the API. And they might just do that because they've got a bug on the system. It might be a denial of service, but maybe they've just got a very busy system and you're going to go, hang on a second, I'm, I'm not happy with one client hitting my API a thousand times a second or whatever because they're going to be stealing all the bandwidth and st stealing all the CPU. So what you can do literally by implement implementing this interface, rate limit interface, is I get to basically say you are allowed so many rate, um, requests a second and if you exceed that you will get back a 429 or whatever it is, too many requests. So the three methods, uh, this is all mentioned again if we go back to the rest stuff here, it's all in here so I'm not making any of this up, honest. There's not very much in there, as you can see. All we do is we've got three methods. And notice that on the user, and this is the identity user, not the ye app user, which is the built-in web user. So this is our user class that we've created that implements the identity interface. So we implement that interface, rate limit interface. We have these three methods. The first one is basically saying, how many things can I have in how many seconds? So obviously you could say you allow 50 in 10 seconds, but then you could say you can have five in one second. So in this example, I've just said you're allowed whatever your rate limit is. Now no, the, notice these are all just properties of the user. So if you look there, the rate limit is one. So I'm saying here you're allowed one request every one second. If you exceed that, you're gonna get an error and we'll see what that error looks like in a second. And then these two methods are basically allowing the system to say what is the current allowance. So they've they've had zero requests and the last time they requested anything was at that timestamp. So that's all that that is. That's the getter. And this one's the setter. The only difference in the setter is you've got a little bit more information because you could say, for instance, oh, if they're calling that action, then that doesn't count towards their allowance or if they call that action, that's quite a big action that counts as five times their normal rate or whatever. So you could do something clever in here. But all we do at the minute is we take those numbers, we save the user. So let's have a look at that. We've got that wide up now. So anything that involves this user, so anything that we pass that token into is going to apply that rate limit. So let's just send this and check that works. Now watch what happens if I send it too quickly why is that not working let me just try this one okay 429 so i'm just trying to work out why one of the controllers uses it and the other one doesn't um and i'm not quite sure off the top of my head why where that's attached i thought it did it on the user but Never mind, I'll worry about that later. But if you can see here, if I if I do it again, it's fine. If I wait a second and I do it, that's fine. But if I do it quickly, then oh, that's a bit interesting, actually. It probably depends how long it takes to actually update the database. And it might also depend on whether the things are cached by default. So it might be that if it's cached because it's the same data all the time, maybe it, maybe it doesn't check the rate limit. Not sure about that. So sorry about that, but the, the rate limiting other than that's fairly straightforward. We simply add those extra methods. So in terms of the rest of the user, as I said before, most of this is identical to the advanced template. I haven't changed any of that. The only things that I have added are this one, which is what you have to do when you're using HTTP bearer auth. You have to add find identity by access token. Now, as I said before, this auth key gets generated automatically when you create a new user. And I think it's used for um, 
for setting a remember me cookie or something but it doesn't really matter what it's used for it's a unique key it works so i'm just using that as my author authentication key so that's dead easy static find one where the auth key matches the token and then the other things is just again because this is a mongodb active record not a normal active record i have to put the collection name in which is user and i have to put the attributes in which are all these and because i'm not creating users via the api i don't need to have all of these in the rules as i said before i actually created a user by running a website pointing it at the same mongodb database and creating a user using the website so there's not much else to say in that so just a last quick look through here to see if there's anything we haven't mentioned yet we have to make sure that's set. I think that's set by default anyway. We just need to change the contents of the user. Most of the rest of this is as default. Yeah, I think that's I think that's mostly it. So as you can see, pretty straightforward stuff. And you can get cracking quite quickly and quite easily. My recommendation, as always, is do things in small steps. So if you start with a module with a thing with a bearer auth and with a cause token and everything else and then you go and try and actually call the thing and it doesn't work you end up kind of scratching your head for ages i was trying to get these things to root properly it took me about three hours and it was just because i wasn't doing it one step at a time and i did say i'd mention this quickly this is called postman i think it's cross-platform i think there's versions for other platforms and it's just a real sweet easy way of calling api endpoints so i've just set up three requests here but obviously you can set up as many as you like you can set the verb you can set the headers you can set you know what's the content type you can set the body of it if it's got a body and all that kind of stuff and you can send it, it keeps a history of what you've done and what happens, but it's kind of everything you need just to get a nice, really cheap and easy and quick, well, cheap is free, so very cheap, way of testing your API. So you could use curl on the command line if you're a bit mad, but it's much easier to use something like this, works really well. You can save things in environments as well. So you could set this environment to be test, which uses a local URL and you could have a production one that calls exactly the same thing but calls it against a production URL and you just do that by you could put placeholders in here so you can create a variable called host and then all of the same requests then end up working for all of the different environments so that's quite cool as well and ooh, let me just put that back in before I forget it I don't think there's probably that much to say about this. Notice that there's kind of headers that you send and headers that come back as well. So sometimes that might help you find out what's going on if, if something's not working in the way you expect. Again, that's good. We don't want a cookie because this is an API. If we get a cookie, we're just wasting time and bandwidth and everything. So download Postman. Nice, quick and easy. You can record stuff. You can you know run six requests one after the other if you want to add something and delete it and add it again and update it and all the rest of it you can do all of those as well but um, that's that and I think that's probably been talking for long enough now so 